It is not advisable to show kindness to a person who is a tyrant, a traitor, or a thief, because kindness encourages him to become worse and does not awaken him. The more kindness you show to a liar, the more he is apt to lie. He thinks that you know not, while you do know, but extreme kindness keeps you from revealing your knowledge. Abdul Baha. O ye beloved of the Lord, the kingdom of God is founded upon equity and justice, and also upon mercy, compassion, and kindness to every living soul. Strive then with all your heart to treat compassionately all humankind, except for those who have some selfish, private motive, or some disease of the soul. Kindness cannot be shown the tyrant, the deceiver, or the thief, because far from awakening them to the error of their ways, it maketh them to continue in the perversity as before. No matter how much kindliness ye may expend upon the liar, he will but lie the more, for he believeth you to be deceived, while ye understand it and understand him but too well, and only remain silent out of your extreme compassion. Abdul Baha. So this week, we're really excited to have Ms. Laley Miller-Miro, and her topic is, are there exceptions to treating people with kindness in the Baha'i faith? Laley Miller-Miro is a mother of three and founded and served as the chief executive officer of the Tahrir Justice Center for over 20 years. Tahrir is a nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting immigrant women, girls, and other survivors from human rights abuses. She led the organization in its service to over 31,000 women and girls. In recognition of its sound management and innovative programs, under Laley's leadership, Tahrir won the Washington Post Award for Management Excellence and its innovative use of pro bono attorneys to quintuple its resources was featured in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. So with that, I'll hand it off to Ms. Miller Miro. Thank you. And um, thank you for the great intro quotes and the wonderful music. Um, it's, um, I'm excited to dive into this topic. Um, before I do though, I want to share just a little bit about the Baha'i Faith broadly. I know that some people come to this with a lot of knowledge of the Baha'i Faith, <clears throat> and some people come to it with um, maybe a little bit of knowledge, but the Baha'i faith um, is a global religion that began in the 1800s and follows the laws and the teachings and the principles of um, Baha'u'llah, who we believe to be the manifestation of God for today. And the Baha'is essentially believe in the unity of all religions because we believe that God periodically sends down divine teachers to help humanity and so we believe that these teachers come about every thousand years and their teachings are relevant to the culture and the time and the place and the people that they come to. And so Baha'is believe in the divinity of Christ, of Muhammad, Buddha, Zoroaster, Krishna, Moses, and, um, and many, many others. Like all of these religions, the Baha'i faith believes in love and kindness towards everyone, including animals. Um, and so the Baha'i faith, like um, all major religions, is here to remind us to love each other and with the ultimate goal of creating unity and world peace. In fact, um, there's a quotation in the Baha'i writings that says that unity is the pivot, I'm sorry, oneness is the pivot round which all of the teachings of Baha'u'llah revolve. So we have to view all of the teachings in the light of ultimately trying to achieve oneness or unity. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today, which is uh, around kindness, is obviously a very important principle in helping all of us achieve oneness and unity. Um, before diving in though, I wanna say some like upfront things. Um, one of the things that I wanna say is kind of a trigger warning, basically. <laughs> I have found that people get triggered in this conversation because they begin to think of the wrongs that they've suffered. And they begin to think of um, some pretty awful situations, actually, that give them some trauma. Um, I also want to acknowledge up front that it may feel uncomfortable to read the writings on this topic because the writings call us to a high standard um, and one that might feel impossible for most of us mere mortals who are really, really struggling every day with um, basic things like kindness towards others. Um, and, but I want to say that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to lean into that. 
Um, we may even feel guilt is like we read some of these quotes and we talk about some of these stories and that's all okay. I mean, guilt is a super healthy emotion. It's the emotion that keeps our behavior in check. What's not okay is if you go into like a shame zone, which is, you know, essentially to say, rather than I did this bad thing, which is more guilt and okay, recognize it, acknowledge it, feel bad about it and do it differently next time. But shame is more like I am a bad person, which is much more difficult to overcome and which is in direct contradiction to what God tells us. God tells us we are all noble beings and we all have the capacity to transform and to change. So I just wanted to say that up front because I, I find in these conversations that stuff comes up a lot for people. Um, I also want to make clear that in the Baha'i writings, um, and one of the unique things about the Baha'i faith in this day and age is that there is no clergy. And so what that means is that no one can really tell you what the writings mean, including me. So like what I'm going to do in this presentation is talk about my imperfect understanding of these writings and my interpretation, imperfect interpretation of what that means, particularly in light of the example of Abdu'l-Baha. And Abdu'l-Baha is the son of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. And Baha'is look to Abdu'l-Baha as a perfect example of what it is to be a Baha'i. So I'll be sharing a lot of stories from his. Um, but I don't have any authority and I might have it wrong. So I just want to say that up front, this is kind of my interpretation. And I really loved having conversations with people who have nuanced and different interpretations, but I present it not as like absolute truth, but as my very limited understanding. Um, and in that regard, because I am going to share so many writings, because what the writings say is way more important than my opinion. Um, uh, I have made all the quotations that I'm going to be sharing today available in a document. And actually, the document is styled as a deepening. So you can take that document, you could bring it to a group, and you, you, know, you can kind of walk through it. It's, it's um, organized in that way. So don't bother asking me, oh, where did that quote come from? You got it yeah, in, in the document that um, I know will be put in the chat and, and maybe again later for people who miss it. Um, okay, so then again, last preliminary point before I dive into all of the details is um, it's really important to understand that the Baha'i writings talk about everything in the context of three protagonists in society, the individual, the community, and institutions. And what's so amazing about that division of that, that concept is that each of the three protagonists have different roles and responsibilities. Sometimes they're overlapping, sometimes they're kind of similar, but, but there are, uh, on a number of, of occasions, very distinct conversations about the role of the individual, the role of community, and the role of society. And that is absolutely true with our topic today. So it's very important that we lean into the complexity of the Baha'i writings. They are not binary. The Baha'i writings are not simple. They are not people are good or bad. They do not do that. <laughs> and um, they talk about different protagonists in society and different ways that we can look at things. Okay, so that's all the preliminary stuff. Trigger warning, the writings, it's only my personal view, opinion, take it or leave it, and you'll have access to the ones directly. And then the three protagonists, and kind of always keep the three protagonists in your mind, um, because these writings definitely are relevant to each of them. For example, the Baha'i writings, and this is a quote from the Universal House of Justice, which is the international governing body of the Baha'is. The Baha'i faith draws a very definite distinction between the duty of the individual to forgive and even to be killed rather than killed and then the duty of society to uphold justice. So those are hugely different, right? Very different roles and responsibilities. We'll dig more into that specifically a little bit later. Okay, so the baseline, kindness. Kindness is the baseline. Kindness is the default. Kindness is the um, assumption. And kindness is what all of the major faiths call us to. Um, Abdu'l-Baha, and I'll be quoting a lot from Abdu'l-Baha, says, in every instance, let the friends be considerate and infinitely kind. Every instance, that's a lot, infinitely kind, 
that's a lot. <laughs> so, it, you know, and then there are a whole lot of writings, literally hundreds of them that go into a lot of detail about what that looks like. So much so that Abdul Baha says again, if someone commits an error or wrong towards you, you must instantly forgive him. So no conditions there, instantly forgive him. Then he goes on to say that if a person falls into error a hundred thousand times, he may yet turn his face to you, hopeful that you will forgive his sins. For he must not become hopeless, neither grieved nor despondent. This is the conduct and the manner of the people of Baha. I don't know about you, but 100,000 times feels like a lot. I know a lot of people who will say, you know, if they've wronged me three times, five times, they're out. <laughs> you know, we have like a low bar. 100,000 times. Um, it was interesting just last night, actually, my my son, my 11-year-old my, uh, son, was asking me what I was doing. I was preparing for this speech. And um, and then later in the night, he talked about how a friend wronged him. And so he's not going to talk to him anymore. And I was like, well, actually, you're supposed to forgive a hundred thousand times. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he was like, I can't. I can't. He's, he's 11, but he was like, I can't really fathom that. And then he he stopped and he thought about it for a minute. And he goes, is that why you still love me? Even when I do things wrong? And I was like, yes but I'm counting, <laughs> like you're on 741 or whatever. No, I'm joking, of course. I would go way past 100,000 times for my own son. Um, but we're supposed to treat everyone as our family. We are all members of the same human family. And so that same instinct is its the faith clearly encourage us to, uh, to apply to others. Okay, um, so what are we forgiving? We're supposed to forgive instantly. We're supposed to forgive 100,000 times, um, but what are we forgiving? It's not light stuff. It's actually really serious stuff that we're supposed to forgive. And this is where I want to go back to my trigger warning before, because I find a lot of people kind of get upset when we start talking about these things, because they're hearing from modern society a much lower threshold for tolerance of people. And that lower threshold for of tolerance the conditions people are placing on whether they'll forgive, the conditions people are placing on whether they'll love, the conditions people are placing for whether or not they'll engage or talk to somebody is being driven by current thinking that is not in line with the Baha'i writings that it may be hard to hear because, you know, and I love lawyers, of course, I'm a lawyer, but your lawyer may be telling you to do something that's not in conformity with the Baha'i writings. Your therapist may be telling you to do something that's not in conformity with the Baha'i writings. And so this is why we have to go to the Baha'i writings um, and, and, and scripture, which has a life shelf life of thousands of years, rather than current thinking that may even change in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years. Um, okay, so what are we forgiving? It's not light stuff. Abdul Baha says, if a soul is seeking to quarrel, so kind of argue with you, ask for reconciliation. If he blame ye, praise him. If he give you a deadly poison, bestow ye an all healing antidote. If he createth death, administer ye eternal life. So death, poisoning, arguing, um, this is serious stuff, this, right? This isn't just you offended me in a conversation. But you may be thinking, okay, but what if they're really mean? <laughs> or what if they're actually injuring me? Okay, well, um, again, Abdu'l-Baha says, in, and this is from the quote before, in every instance, let the friends be considerate and infinitely kind. Let them never be defeated by the malice of the people, by their aggression and by their hate, no matter how intense. So even if a person hates you, no matter how intense. If others hurl darts against you, offer them milk and honey in return. If they poison your lives, sweeten their souls. If they injure you, teach them how to be comforted. If they inflict a wound upon you, be a balm to their sores. If they sting you, 
hold to their lips a refreshing cup. Very high bar. Then you may be thinking, okay, but what if they're really bad? Like what if they're a traitor or a tyrant? Well, Abdu'l-Bahá says that we must be faithful to the traitors and benevolent to the tyrant. We must recognize the enemies as friends and the unknown as the known. These are the advices and exhortations of God. But then you may say, but what if I've suffered domestic violence? And this is an issue I know well. Well, there was an individual Baha'i that specifically wrote the House of Justice um, about her condition of domestic violence. And what they said is, to forgive him will not be easy. And this is not something to which either you or members of your family can force. Nevertheless, you should know that forgiveness is the standard which individual Baha'is are called upon to attain. And it's an essential part of the spiritual growth of a person who has been wronged. To nurse a grievance or hatred against another soul is spiritually poisonous to the soul who nurses it. Okay, then you may say, okay, but what if my parents were so physically abusive that they killed my brother? What if they sexually abused me? This is real. And again, this individual wrote a letter to the House of Justice and was told as a devoted believer, you are urged to strive to develop forgiveness in your heart toward your parents who have abused you in so disgraceful a manner and to attain a level of insight which sees them as captives of their lower nature, whose actions can only lead them deeper into unhappiness, and separation from God. By these means, you can liberate yourself from the anger to which you refer in your letter. Okay, but what if someone murdered members of my family and was directly at times and then indirectly at other times complicit in the death of thousands of people from my religious community? This happened to Abdu'l-Bahá. Now, this is really amazing, this, this story that I'm going to tell you. Um, so as many of you know, in Persia in the 1800s, um, where the Baha'i faith was uh, founded, there were mass atrocities against Baha'is. Baha'is were tortured and paraded, dragged and cut up in the streets. They were sent to dungeons, their family homes were burned, and some of that persecution is still happening today. So Baha'is have suffered greatly um, in Iran and in Persia at that time. Abdul Baha, the son of the prophet founder of Baha'u'llah, suffered personally. Members of his family were killed. His own family was exiled, imprisoned. His father was um, imprisoned, his whole family. They were tortured. There were so many horrible conditions, right? The leader of the Baha'i, the, the leader of Persia at that time was called Nasruddin Shah. Nasruddin Shah was um, kind of really responsible for a lot of this persecution and a lot of the death. And then his son who ruled over a certain territory and then his sons who ruled over certain villages were directly responsible. They gave the orders to execute mass numbers of Baha'is. Well, as time went by, the son of Nasruddin Shah and his sons were exiled. Politics changed in Persia and they were exiled to France. When Abdul Baha was finally released a prisoner, when he was around 70 years old, he spent his whole life as a prisoner. And in the last years, he was a prisoner under the Ottoman Empire. And this was all because of his faith. When he was released after a, a short period in Egypt where he regained his health, because he, he had a lot of health issues from his tortures, his imprisonment, attempted poisons against his life, all these kinds of things. After that, the first place he went to was France. And then the first place that he, oh, sorry, I got it wrong, Switzerland, it was Switzerland. And then the first place he went to was this particular location. So imagine this, just out of prison, your first chance at freedom, and this is who he sees. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read kind of a, a telling of the story. 
under circumstances that could have only been orchestrated by God himself. Abdu'l-Bahá was in Geneva, Switzerland, and was pacing back and forth on a terrace of a hotel where he was staying. When Zilu's Sultan, who is the son of Nasruddin Shah, saw him, now he was an exile, so he was Persian, but he was wearing French garb, and he sees on the banister of this hotel a man wearing Persian garb. Abdu'l-Bahá didn't wear Western garb when he traveled even to the West, so he was wearing a long robe and a turban, and he saw him like looking up at this hotel. He's like, that's a Persian guy, and I'm Persian. You know, I'd like to actually see who he is because I'm in exile. Maybe he's in exile too. I don't know. Maybe he thought they would be friends. So he basically said, hey, I see this person. He asked somebody, who is that? And that person said, well, that is Abdu'l-Bahá. And he asked to meet Abdu'l-Bahá. And Abdu'l-Bahá granted him a meeting. Now, imagine this. Abdu'l-Bahá is meeting the person, one of the people directly responsible for his like lifelong suffering and the murder and the death of his family and many, many other people. When he met Abdu'l-Bahá, he did not apologize. He did not express remorse for the suffering of his family or thousands of innocent believers. According to a witness, he was mumbling miserable excuses. But Abdu'l-Bahá took the prince in his arms and comforted him. It like makes me cry, actually. Like I think, what? <laughs> I don't know that I could do that. So he took him in his arms and he comforted him. And he said, all of this is in the past. He said, never think of it again and send your two sons to see me. I want to meet your sons. So Abdu'l-Bahá is not only saying, okay, I'm going to meet this guy. He, he, didn't accept, he didn't wait for an apology. He had no conditions, you know, on his own forgiveness. But it's not only like, I'll meet with you. It's now I want to meet the rest of your family and hang out with you, which is a whole other level of engagement. So Abdu'l-Bahá invites him back and invites his two sons back. And, um, and what's, what's, you know, anyway, it's very interesting because the story kind of goes on and on. His sons were there. His sons feel super guilty and can't believe how nice he's being. One of them simply goes away because he can't handle the guilt. And then the other one becomes a Baha'i. So interesting. So anyway, it's, it's an amazing story, but an incredible example, again, of, of this high bar of forgiveness. Even when you are personally, when you are so affected, and then that person, and clearly when that person is a tyrant. Like there is no other better definition of a tyrant than Nasruddin Shah and his son and his son's sons. So, so these are real examples of Abdu'l-Bahá living out these writings that we are told to. So then you might say, well, but what if someone was trying to kill me? Like I was in present danger because you could say, okay, well, that person was now in exile. They're not the ruler anymore. They don't have the capacity to harm Abdu'l-Bahá anymore. But what if somebody in real time was trying to kill me? Again, trigger warning, this is really hard stuff because it doesn't jive with, with us and definitely doesn't jive with what modern society is telling us. So Abdu'l-Bahá had a half son, uh, sorry, a half brother who was pretty awful. When Baha'u'lláh died, he confiscated all of Baha'u'lláh's belongings and he took them away. He also took control of the resources and put Abdu'l-Bahá's family into poverty. He wouldn't allow Abdu'l-Bahá to visit his own father's grave. Um, he wrote the Ottoman Empire and told lies about Abdu'l-Bahá to try to get Abdu'l-Bahá executed. And he tried to uh, poison Abdu'l-Bahá several times. Okay. His name was Mirza Muhammad Ali. Mirza Muhammad Ali tried to kill Abdu'l-Bahá on multiple uh, times. Late one night, a gunman hired by Mirza Muhammad Ali fired three shots at Abdu'l-Bahá, all of which failed to hit him. Abdu'l-Bahá did not show the slightest sign of perturb perturbation at this incident and kept walking with great dignity and majesty. In another instance, one of Mirza Muhammad Ali's men, on two different occasions, placed poison in a jug of his drinking water, but it was discovered. And then in another attempt, 
one of Mirza Muhammad Ali's followers carried a dagger hidden under his clothes with the intention of taking Abdul Baha's life, but again did not succeed. In all of these instances, the men regretted their actions. So the one who tried to put poison in the jug, the one that tried to shoot him, the one that had the dagger and tried to stab him, each time they, they felt bad and, and, they, and, and Abdul Baha forgave them and let them back into his circle and into the community. A lot of people would have said, okay, in the name of boundaries, <laughs> like that's a boundary and I'm not going to, Abdul Baha um, forgave. Now, what's interesting is the guy who poisoned him, and you can look this up, it was the same guy that tried to poison him twice. And Baha'u'llah, or sorry, Abdul Baha gave him forgiveness in between the two times. And so again, it's a good example of, okay, you give someone forgiveness, but then they do the thing again. Abdul Baha just kept forgiving him a hundred thousand times. So, um, okay, um, and then and then there's another story about how Abdul Baha even invited this half brother to his daughter's wedding. And even when at the daughter's wedding, he openly jeered and mocked the simplicity of it. They were only able to serve tea because they were in poverty as a result of what the brother was doing. And he mocked them openly at the wedding saying, this is ridiculous, they're only serving tea or whatever he said. And Abdul Baha still invited him. So again, like it wasn't like, oh, he's out of my life now because he's tried to kill me four times. <laughs> he's still, he invited him to his daughter's wedding. Okay, so the example of Abdul Baha. Um, so I've looked really hard for an exception to forgive those who've wronged me. And it's really hard to find an exception as you can see in these writings. Okay, so, um, but there is one exception to treating someone with kindness that's mentioned in the writings. But again, I want you to remember the three protagonists because that's what's really important when we understand this concept because you've seen clearly from the writings and from Abdul Baha's example that he forgives and is kind to and embraces and includes and doesn't estrange himself from even the most extreme, you know, kinds of circumstances and people. Okay, so, um, so the quote that gives us this exception is actually a really long quotation. And um, it is one that was mentioned at the very beginning um, of the introduction of the presentation. Um, and the, the whole discussion of Abdul Baha around the deceiver, the tyrant, and the thief, where this is the context in which the exception is given. The whole quotation is five paragraphs long. Four out of five of those paragraphs are about the treatment of animals. Only one and the smaller one is actually about the liar, the tyrant, and the thief, or the, the deceiver. By the way, the old quote uh, talked about liar, and then uh, uh, the Universal House of Justice issued a new translation of that quote, which is deceiver. And that's important because a deceiver is actually different than a liar. A deceiver has a more systematic approach. Um, and you can look them up in the dictionary. But anyway, it's, um, it's, it's, it's significant and kind of strategic and well thought out. Um, and then it talks about the tyrant and the thief, but it goes on to talk about, and, and I won't reread the quote because she read it at the very beginning. I was going to do that, but I think you've already heard the quote. Um, I'll dissect it in greater detail in a minute, but what I want to jump to is the fact that um, I personally was feeling like I was hearing a lot of Baha'is misuse this quote. I was hearing Baha'is use the quote. So, in, you know, one can say, well, oh, well, first of all, people can call people tyrants or deceivers or thieves or say you have a selfish motive or, um, you know, it, we can judge people harshly around that. Um, and I'm going to go into what the writings say about what those words mean, because I think it's actually important to do that. Um, but I was a bit concerned and I wrote the House of Justice about this quotation. They wrote me back. And they said, Abdul Baha's advice to withhold kindness so that someone does not take advantage of you. So it's a protective thing, ultimately, about just not being taken advantage of. 
however, is not a license for treating others with injustice, hostility, or disdain, which is nowhere permitted in the Baha'i writings. This passage should be understood in the context of a multitude of other statements which describe how Baha'is are called to act in relation to other souls. Okay, so that's what the House of Justice told me in response to that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at the writings, um, how this quote is in relation to a lot of other writings. So what does the quotation really mean? Well, I mentioned already that it, the most of it is about the treatment of animals. Um, and so, for example, I'm going to read uh, one section of that. Most human beings are sinners, but the beasts are innocent. Surely those without sin receive the most kindness and love. All accept animals which are harmful, as bloodthirsty wolves, such as poisonous snakes, and similar pernicious creatures. The reason being that kindness to these is an injustice to human beings and other animals as well. If, for example, ye be tender-hearted towards a wolf, this is but tyranny to the sheep for a wolf will destroy a whole flock of sheep. So this is kind of interesting because he's drawing, so this is a parallel discussion in the context of animals to exactly how the earlier quote that related to humans is, is issued. So that's a really instructive interpretive point. And what he's saying here, it's not about like being mad at the wolf. It's not about hating the wolf. It's probably not even about recognizing, in fact, a, a, a friend, just today on my Facebook post to this, I thought it was so profound. The ecosystem actually depends on the wolf. So, you know, it's in, in, in this is um, in the Midwest, they got really mad at the wolves and they tried to eliminate the wolves because the wolves were killing deers and all these things. But what they found was with two little wolves, <laughs> it messed up the ecosystem. So anyway, we can look at like, you know, and, and that's to say, I mean, we still have to protect the sheep from the wolves. But the thing is, it's not personal. That's the thing. It's not rooted in hatred. It's not rooted in resentment. It's as the, the House of Justice says, it's not rooted in injustice, hostility, or disdain, which is nowhere permitted in the writings. It's not about that. It's about protection. That's what it's about. And so an exception to kindness, as it's very clearly talked about in this quotation, not taken out of context, but read, read, uh, reading it in its entirety, is fundamentally about protection. It's not a license to be unkind. And I think, you know, it's easy to be like, oh, an exception to kindness, I can therefore be unkind <laughs> to somebody. Not what it says. It's not what it says. It talks about protection, which is also fundamentally about justice. Okay, so let's really break down the quote. Who does this quote apply to? in addition to wolves, poisonous snakes, rabid dogs, as the quote clearly discusses. Okay, first the quotation refers to someone who has a quote, selfish, private motive, or some disease of the soul. Okay, this is very interesting because, well, first of all, we're all selfish. Like the writings actually tell us that, that we all have lower natures, ego, and, and kind of self-centeredness. I mean, the writings use the word very directly, selfish. So on a good day, bad day, all of us can be accused of having that quality to some degree. Okay, private motive. Again, most of us should have a common motive. We should prioritize community and the well-being of others over the well-being of ourselves. You know, um, other religions have the golden rule. The Baha'i faith actually has like the, I care about you over myself rule, not just I will treat you as I would treat myself rule, which is a really, really high bar. Um, but then it says disease of the soul. Okay, so I looked up disease of the soul in the Baha'i writings, and it is referred to very clearly again and again and again and again as being referring to covenant breakers. Covenant breakers are people who, um, it's not about not wanting to be a Baha'i. Covenant breakers in the Baha'i faith are those who affirmatively actively campaign against the faith. They are people who are Baha'is who decide to kind of subvert with, within and they challenge doctrine and leadership and like but very basic notions, not just asking questions or what we're all actually encouraged to do. It's not a submissive faith. Believers don't just like lay down. We ask questions. 
this is very different. This is about actively opposing. So covenant breakers, if you, and you know, I would encourage everyone, don't take my word for it. Google spiritual disease, Baha'i faith. You will see the only references that come up are to covenant breakers. And, um, and it's, it's like again and again and again and again. Now, what's also interesting about that is that it's not up to you and me to decide who's a covenant breaker. Institutions have to do it. And only the House of Justice is allowed to designate someone a covenant breaker. And there is a justice process. There's a truth finding. So it's not just one person's opinion on a situation. It's multiple people's opinion on a situation to decipher truth, um, which you know any good justice process has multiple perspectives on something to decipher truth that allows the person accused to talk about their perspective, whatever. Okay, so uh, covenant breakers. Then the, the quotation refers to the tyrant, the deceiver, or the thief. Okay, according to the dictionary, a tyrant is a cruel and oppressive ruler. Then when you go to the Baha'i writings and you look at the writings further, uh, where it's referred to as tyrant, where tyrant is referred to in the Baha'i writings, over 20 references to tyrant in the Baha'i writings specifically reference kings and leaders of nations. So again, consistent with the dictionary definition, it's a cruel and oppressive ruler. Also, when one looks at the historic context in which Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha lived, to, wh to whom they referred to as tyrants, were not mere bullies or people who offended other people. Again, they were rulers who oppressed people. They had authority, they had power, um, and they used that power abusively. They tortured and killed large numbers of people, all the people that Baha'u'llah referred to as tyrants. Okay, then, you know, a deceiver, that's probably intuitive to all somebody who, you know, doesn't just like lie a few times, but has this, um, campaign or strategy around deception. Um, a thief is somebody who steals, um, according to the definitions, especially secretly or without open force, one who is guilty of theft or larceny. Okay. Um, and these are also criminal designations. Um, again, when one is naming someone or accusing someone of being a criminal, there must be a justice process around that. It's not a subjective individual determination. Um, and it's not a, a, a low bar of behavior, as you can see in the way Baha'u'llah referred to tyrant and the way the writings refer to all of these spiritual disease, um, and then even the dictionary definition of these words, the bar is very, very high. Okay, so, but what if we are faced with a legit deceiver, tyrant? or a thief. Okay. So somebody who really is and, and like was, you know, decided and designated as, as, as that. I mentioned before this quotation where the Baha'i faith draws a very definite distinction between the duty of an individual to forgive and even be killed rather than kill and the duty of society to implement justice. So this is what's really important here because um, I, I'm going to, use Abdul Baha's words to explain the Baha'i concept of justice. This is in Some Answered Questions in a chapter called uh, The Treatment of Criminals. If someone oppresses, injures, and wrongs another, and the wronged man retaliates, this is vengeance, and it is censurable. No, rather he must return good for evil and not only forgive, but also, if possible, be of service to his oppressor. If one person assaults another, the injured one should forgive him, but communities must protect the rights of man. So if someone assaults, injures, oppresses, and wounds me, this is Abdu'l-Baha talking, I will offer no resistance and I will forgive him. But if a person wishes to assault, and he uses a name in the quotation, it's a very long name, but wishes to assault someone else, certainly I will prevent him. Okay, so in one moment, Abdu'l-Baha is the victim different behavior. In another moment, Abdul Baha is a member of the community. He's witness to someone else. And it's not, a, he doesn't have to be part of an institution, right? It's community. Institutions have a role to play, clearly. But he's a member of community. He's now a bystander. And he says, if, he's, if this person is trying to kill you, I will protect you with my life. 
right? That's such a, so fascinating because it's such a different concept. And so what it requires, what I think it calls us to do is to really improve our ability to forgive when we have been wronged, but it also really um, calls on us to improve our ability to advocate for others, to intervene, to be an ally and to demand justice. Again, not rooted in emotion, not rooted in anger or vengeance or hostility or resentment, but rooted as this quotation talked about, particularly in the context of the wolf, the rabid dog, the poisonous snake, snake rooted in the idea of protection. I'm not gonna let you hurt somebody because we gotta protect people from you. I love you, but there are gonna be some boundaries here. I don't resent you. I'm not gonna be mad at you, but there are gonna be consequences here. So this is the concept of justice. I, I think of it often, you know, when, when we have a hard time thinking like, ah, how can we treat someone like this? Somebody who's really upset us or hurt us or abused us, oppressed us. I often think of a mother's justice. And I'd like to think that all well, parents, I don't think it's just mothers, but this idea that, you know, you could have a kid that's hitting your other kid. You will intervene. <laughs> you will say, stop. You will issue consequences. You will issue punishments. You will reward them when they're faced with the same stress and they don't retaliate in violence. You'll be like, oh, good job. You didn't hit this time. You're right. So there's reward, there's punishment. That is justice. But you love them always. And you would never like estrange yourself from your own kid, right? You would never say, I'm done with you. I'm not talking to you. That's what justice is. It's an engaged justice in the Baha'i faith. It's a loving justice. It is consequential. It involves punishment. It involves reward when you're doing well. It also involves healing and unity. The, 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 in the Baha'i writings, it says the purpose of justice is the appearance of unity. So the end goal of justice in the Baha'i writings, which is very important, is not punishment, which is a very Western model of justice. The end goal in the Baha'i writings is unity. So when we stop engaging with each other, that's impossible. And Western notions would have people not engage with each other. Okay, so um, in the few minutes I have left before we open up for questions, um, the Baha'i writings make clear, so I think we've made clear already this really high bar for individual love, individual kindness, individual forgiveness. I think we've made clear the fact that justice so the protection of others for the sake of, of protection has to also happen at the same time. But okay, let's say we're the victim. What are we allowed to do and not do in response? And we might be feeling really um, heavy by this idea that we need to forgive and be kind, even in light of all kinds of bad behavior. So I wanted to break it down based on a lot of the what ifs that I get from people when we have these conversations. So there are five things that we're told we cannot do. Whatever you do, you cannot do these things in response to abuse and oppression. We can't backbite about somebody. Um, backbiting or gossip speaking badly about somebody is considered the most grievous of sins in the Baha'i writings. Um, the other thing we can't do is estrange ourselves from somebody. The Baha'i writings say nothing whatsoever can in this day inflict greater harm upon this cause than dissension strife and contention and estrangement and apathy among the loved ones of God. Um, so we're told estrangement hurts the Baha'i faith. And then we're also told that should the least trace, so it's not even like big estrangement, but the least trace of estrangement, uh, should the least, sorry, I'm reading the quotation, should the least trace of estrangement prevail the result shall be darkness upon darkness, okay? Another thing, these are five things we cannot do. Whatever we do, we can't do these things. You also can't avoid discomfort. Now, this is really important because I think there are a lot of well-meaning friends, even well-meaning therapists, lots of memes on Instagram, lots of self-help books that would say to people, you don't have to be uncomfortable. And, and this is particularly loved by people with privilege who are used to not being in discomfort. But the Baha'i writings again and again remind us that this life and everything we experience, we should lean into discomfort, we should lean into tests, and that is how we grow, not by protecting our comfort. 
rest thou not for a moment, seek thou not to draw an easeful breath, that thou mayest become a symbol of God's love. Another quote says, whatsoever may happen is for the best, because affliction is but the essence of bounty, and sorrow and toil are mercy unalloyed, and anguish is peace of mind, and to be make, make a sacrifice is to receive a gift. So again, like we have this view in the Baha'i writings to lean into discomfort. Um, the fourth thing that we can't do is demonize or label somebody. Part of that has to do with we're always growing and we're always changing. Um, but the writings say, cleanse ye your eyes so that ye behold no man as different from yourself. See ye no strangers, rather see all men as friends, for love and unity come hard when ye fix your gaze on otherness. We must neither see harshness nor injustice, neither malevolence nor hostility, nor hate, but rather turn our eyes toward the heavenly ancient, he, the heaven of ancient glory. Okay, and another quote, when we find a person who's fallen into the depths of misery or sin, we must be kind to them, treat them as a friend, not an enemy. We have no right to look upon anyone as evil. And that's important. People label people, oh, they're evil or whatever. We're not allowed to do that. Okay, the fifth thing we can't do is violence. Now, okay, that might seem like obvious, but you can't hit people. You can't retaliate with violence. Now, some people may very rightly so ask about self-defense. Um, the writings have actually addressed this. And Abdul Baha says, if he who is struck forgives, nay, if he acts in a manner contrary to that, which has been used towards him, that is what is laudable. That's what we're told. The house of justice, then uh, somebody wrote the house and was kind of like, what do I do about high, one, high women? I don't know if I'm saying it right, but like thieves on the road, robbers, that kind of thing. And Abdul Baha says, in the case of attack by robbers and high women, a Baha'i should not surrender himself, but should try as far as circumstances permit to defend himself. And later on, lodge, later on, lodge a complaint with the government authorities. In a letter written on behalf of the guardian, he also indicates that in an emergency where there is no legal force at hand to appeal to, a Baha'i is justified in defending his life. So this seems to be the one instance where we're able to defend ourselves. It's like when there's country crime and lawlessness. So that's very interesting. People then say, okay, well, what about you know boundaries? And there is a quote on mental illness, but it applied to the institutions. So I don't know if this is fair to say to individuals, but it basically said if a person's mental health problems are affecting the community, the assembly may wish to establish clear boundaries. Um, and if necessary, with explicit consequences for violating the boundaries. So you get a chance, right? So the person says, okay, here are the boundaries, explicit consequences. And, um, and it's interesting because the NSA, I know this from personal experience, really insists on giving that person many chances. It's very interesting. Um, and then care should be, uh, taken to establish boundaries that are reasonable and consequences that are appropriate. Again, not rooted in emotion or a subjective sense of what you're triggered by, but an objective sense of what is appropriate or consequential. I know that's a lot, and I'm sorry for kind of like going on and on and on with so much of that, um, but this is hard step. It's, I'm not good at it. I do not personally um, exemplify this. I'm trying, and I don't. And I know that we all struggle with this really high bar, but we're all dealing with it every day. And it's it's important that we grapple. So um, so now we'll, we'll open up for questions. Thank you so much for such a timely talk, uh, especially with you know things going on in the world today, but um, we really appreciate it. So if anyone has questions, you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, so could you speak a little, so there's some questions about the death penalty and, you know, the Baha'i stance on that, I guess. Yeah. 
So um, there are, um, it, it's, there's a book of law called the Katabi Akdas, which lays out a number of punishments um, that is kind of envisioned for a future society. And I would like to think, for example, that the future society has a different justice system than the one that we have now as a lawyer working in it, um, that is less racist, for example, that does not rely on someone's ability to find justice through their ability to hire a lawyer right now. So, uh, you know, I love lawyers and I, we're working within, I'm a lawyer and we work within a current legal system, but my personal view is justice shouldn't be dependent on whether you've got an articulate advocate. And that in, in turn should not depend on whether you can afford to hire the best one. Our current system is about who wins, not who is what is what the truth is. And in fact, the judge in court process is uh, their hands are tied. They're not even allowed to inject or interrupt or ask clarifying questions to get at the truth. So our current process, in my humble opinion, does not allow for truth seeking. It is not just, and it is racist. There are lots of problems with it. Um, however, um, so one can critique the death penalty in like the current situation, but in the Katabi Akdas in the Book of Laws, the death penalty is in fact there for certain crimes like murder and arson. And what's so interesting too about the framing in the Baha'i faith around justice is that it's seen not only on this earthly plane, but it's seen with a longer timeline horizon and one that traverses into the Abha kingdom where the next world, which is what Baha'is kind of call that next life that we, we experience when we die in this one, and we're told that if we don't experience justice adequately in this life, it will be much worse for us. Divine justice will be much worse in the next life. And so this is actually, it gives me personal, um, and I, I, I need it in my life because of different things that have happened, where justice was not going to happen in this world. It gave me confidence and comfort to know that God's got it. <laughs> It'll be handled in the next life. and. Um, that brings me some comfort. Yeah. Thanks. Can you um, just go through again the five things we're not allowed to do? Oh, sure. Okay. So the five things we're not allowed to do, violence, demonizing or labeling someone, avoiding discomfort, estrangement, or backbiting. Thank you. Um, who decides who is a mental case? Um, well, this, so not me, that's for sure. <laughs> I think, you know, this is where we need a justice process. It's not fair, really, for one person to singularly label somebody, designate them, particularly in these criminal terms. Um, and, you know, every justice process um, and, and, you know, like I said, I really hope in the future there is a much more enlightened and fair process. However, um, the Baha'i writings in every instance where it is discussed talks about independent investigation of truth, seeing through your own eyes and not through the eyes of others. So we know that there's a truth element, like a fact finding element that's got to be really rigorous in order to truly determine. Maybe that will involve getting multiple opinions, multiple people to weigh in. I don't know if it'll be a jury you know, system or whatever it is, but I think we do have to be very careful, particularly if we're not professional. I mean, in the case of mental illness, you know, there are professionals who are the ones who are have that ability to designate. And even then, you, one might need multiple opinions on the situation. But I think, you know, we have to be careful. Mere mortals should not be going around judging people. Um, it, you know, I, I think we live in a voyeuristic society right now. Um, even there might be like a case on television or something in social media and people are very quick to judge and say, this is whose side I'm on, this is whose side, you know. Where my understanding of the Baha'i ratings is, is that that's not our business. It's like the people in the room are the only ones who really know, and even they have different perspectives. And then it's really only the job of those who are designated as the judge and the juror to be the ones who are the judge and the juror. 
And then we have to defer to that, even if it's not perfect. Something that was really hard for me to swallow, because um, again, as a lawyer, I know the faults of our justice system, was a story I read of Abdul Baha in Akka. This is where he was imprisoned for many, many, many years. This was in what was then called Palestine. It was a part of the Ottoman Empire. And it had a horrible justice system. I mean, if you read anything contextually in history about that place at that time, you could never say that was any better than what we have now. In fact, you could easily say it was worse. However, people would come to Abdul Baha and they weren't even Baha'is from the community who, who respected him. And they would ask him frequently for help. When Abdul Baha was approached by domestic violence victims and child abuse victims, there are stories of this. He said to them, or their advocates who often came on their behalf, that they must go to the courts. And Abdul Baha had a handful of lawyers that he trusted, and he paid the legal fees for them. So Abdul Baha did pro bono law. <laughs> it made me feel much better, kind of given my what I ended up doing. But but so if Abdul Baha in those instances was saying, you know, I'm not going to intervene, I'm not a vigilante, I'm not going to go in. Um, but here's a lawyer and go to the justice system. If he did that in the 1800s Palestine Ottoman Empire dictatorship um, in Akka, then we have to defer, even if imperfect, and then know that there is going to be justice in the next life, even if it's not adequately um, dished out in this life. Thank you. Um, so this question is about basically this requirement to forgive. Do you think people can just read it and implement it? Or do people have to go through suffering and experience to then understand the value of forgiveness? Mm, that's true for every principle, right? Like, it's like, um, you know, I can read a quote on patience and be like, yes, I am patient and I will be patient. But then I'm tested. <laughs> And then I like I you know then I'm like I have flights that are canceled and then they're delayed and then they're delayed and then they're delayed and then I get pissed off and I'm like okay apparently I'm not patient you know I thought I was when I read the quote I agreed to be in my head but apparently I'm not I don't think any of us can really say we've got a principle down until we're tested and and even then <laughs> I think it's hard to say you know there are no degrees handed out for like passing this spiritual test or achieving this spiritual quality or whatever. And I think even if we get it right, at least I know for myself, I can feel good about my capacity to have a certain spiritual quality in good measure. And then on another day and another month, on another year, I fall backwards and I need help again, building that spiritual capacity back up again. So I feel like it's hard. So um, this next question is, someone is working uh, in their city in Croatia with many Ukrainian refugees, mostly women and children, and they're offering classes using some of the Baha'i texts. So their question is, how can I foster understanding about love in the context of war and oppression? Mm. Well, I mean, maybe these quotes can be helpful. <laughs> the, the document um, that has been put in the chat for you um, is styled as a deepening. It might be something that you can reflect on. I think the one thing I would point out, because if you are a tutor or an animator or you are accompanying people, one thing that's important to remember is that this is deeply personal, you know, and you can encourage someone to read the holy writings for themselves and, 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 and make decisions for themselves, but you can't impose it on people. And even the House of Justice in that letter that it wrote to someone who had faced very extreme abuse at the hands of their parents said, no one can force you to forgive, but it doesn't change the standard. You know what I mean? Like, and so I think that's the thing we can't rationalize away. Like, well, I don't have to forgive. No, 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 you do, but you can't. Those are two different things. So to say, you know, I'm incapable of doing it um, or, you know, I'm incapable of interacting with you because you really, really trigger me, even though I'm told I shouldn't estrange myself from you. Like, that's okay. I mean, if we're imperfect. And I think, you know, people sometimes can't do things because we're growing and, and we need help or we're maturing and we still need evolution. But we shouldn't confuse our inability to do something with the writings that the standard in the writings somehow 
going down. So, um, so somebody, you know, can read them, but I don't think we should be judging others. And <clears throat> particularly as a lawyer, um, I never tell my clients they should forgive. Like that is not my job. And, and, you know, even if they're Christian and I know that's in their faith or, or whatever, but <clears throat> in that moment, when they're coming to me with stories of human trafficking and rape and torture and forced abortion and all kinds of other things, I, in that moment, represent community. And I am accompanying them in the um, entering the institutions of the justice system. So my job is justice. Their very private, very personal work might be forgiveness, but that's not for me to judge or remind them of. Um, so I, I think it just depends on your role and whether that's appropriate for your role. Thank you. Um, so this question is about your book, Do You Hear Them When They Cry? And so they're asking, are there any new developments or action being taken with respect to the issue about you know, violence against women? All the time. <laughs> it's such an evolving field. <clears throat> the law is evolving. Um, even the legal precedent in that case um, was overturned by the last presidential administration in the United States. And then the new presidential administration came in and reinstated it. Um, but there is still a lot of uh, legal fixing that has to be done in, in, in order to ensure gender-based uh, uh, gender persecution as a grounds for asylum that's protected for women. Um, Fazia herself is doing well. Um, she got married. She had tripl triplets. Her boys are now 18 years old. They're doing really well. Um, the Tahare Justice Center continues to do the work that... Um, I started the organization with the money from the book and served as its CEO until late last year. For anyone who is interested in becoming involved or supporting efforts to bring justice um, and stop violence against women, please do look up the Tahare Justice Center. They need support. They're doing incredible work. I continue to be involved. I continue to be supportive. Um, and you can get a lot of updates on what's happening in the law and in society. Thanks so much. So this question is about estrangement um, and some people use it as a defense mechanism against you know, people that have harmed them. Um, so some people are harmful due to ignorance and some are harmful due to willful insensitivity or arrogance. Um, what steps would you recommend to address a mutual responsibility to overcome this? Mutual. So I think that's what the therapist will say. <laughs> I think that's what kind of common language is like, um, the problem is that's not what the writings say. The writings don't place conditions on forgiveness. They don't say, you got to do this before I forgive you. So again, remember that example of Nasruddin Shah's son. He did not apologize. <laughs> he didn't work on himself. He, you know, there was no like mutuality in that. Um, similar with Abdul Baha's half brother, no mutuality. He didn't make any efforts and still Abdul Baha forgave and ab still Abdul Baha did not estrange himself. I think so. I'm sorry, I can't make that better for you. I'm sorry. I don't see it in the writings. I mean, I really, I really have looked actually. And if anybody happens to come up with like a story of Abdul Baha, you know, where he did estrange himself and be careful because covenant breaking, again, that was like the one instance where we're, we can cut off ties, it's the only one. And um, and again, only the House of Justice can designate someone a covenant breaker. So it's not a parallel analogy that can be used to any other situation. Um, but, you know, but, but I think, I mean, we can have boundaries with, I think, this is just Laylee talking, this is not like the Baha'i writings, because by the way, the Baha'i writings never refer to the word boundaries. I have looked, it doesn't exist anywhere in the Baha'i writings. That's not a phrase, it's not a word, it's a current day thing. And, and, and again, if you look at these stories of Abdul Baha, a lot of people would be like, oh man, he should draw some boundaries, <laughs> you know? And, and it, so it, again, this is not the writings, my personal opinion is that there are ways to love people, not estrange ourselves from them and to have boundaries, you know? So I don't know, maybe, you know, somebody who's who's really, and you can even say to somebody, hey, look, these topics, whenever we talk about them, we always get into an argument. Can we not talk about those topics? Okay, one way, you know, boundary. Or, you know, dealing with somebody really triggers you, reminds you a bunch of stuff. You have a panic attack, an anxiety attack. 
you know, maybe you make sure that you're only interacting with that person when you're accompanied by somebody who makes you feel really comfortable. Maybe that support provides help. Maybe you see that person once a month rather than every single day. You know, I don't know. I don't know. But it seems to me that there, there are ways um, to navigate that. I mean, I've just experienced that in my own personal life. But I will say this. I will say this. There is nothing, nothing more powerful, empowering, and like uplifting than dealing with somebody in kindness who's wronged you. Like there's a feeling you get from that of pride in yourself and empowerment. Like I could do that. And it also helps decondition. It helps uncondition the triggering that you might have when you've thought about that person and you've remembered what they did wrong and you fantasized about yelling at them or, you know, whatever it may be. It helps decondition it. Um, it's a cool thing, actually. And, you know, when I when I read these stories of Abdu'l-Bahá, who kind of smiled and hugged Nazruddin Shah's son, just I didn't think that must have felt really good for Abdu'l-Bahá. <laughs> it's like, because you're in control. You haven't given that person control. You're in control. And then also you're not harboring the resentment that the House of Justice talks in all of those letters of people who keep, you know, writing them about, I've been wronged and I've been wronged. And but what about this? And but this is really bad. The House of Justice says, free yourself of that anger and that hatred through forgiveness. It's actually really empowering. Thank you. Um, would you say it's correct to say that uh, liberal Western legal systems are based on resolution of conflict rather than justice? No, I would not say that um, <laughs> at all. And, and in fact, I think they're, they're based on punishment as the mechanism of justice, not resolution. Um, you know, the Western legal system, when you look at the way the courtroom is set up, when you look at court procedure, legal procedure, um, even the hired guns, you know, the, the lawyers, it's all about winning. It's all about jabbing. It's about demeaning the other person, making them look not credible, dominating the conversation. Like in law school, we were taught how to interrupt people, how to um, cut people's uh, like point down, how to belittle it, how to point holes in it, how to distract the jury from the real truth and get them upset about this other truth. It's all manipulative and all designed not towards reconciliation, not towards really understanding or healing, it has nothing to do with healing and, 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 or hearing other sides authentically it has to do with who wins in the courtroom. So no, I, I would disagree with that statement. I would say the complete opposite. Um, yes. So I think that's all the questions we have. So thanks so much, Ms. Villamiro. We really appreciated your talk and your expertise. And uh, thank you to everyone for all your questions as well. Thanks for joining. This is hard stuff. And it's not nice to hear, you know, every time I know when I'm facing a really difficult situation or, <clears throat> and and um and I I am privileged and I have not experienced a lot of oppression. I have experienced injustice, um, but not nearly what uh, my clients have faced and others who I love have faced. And on their behalf, as well as at different times mine, I've really sought to find an excuse, to find a way out, <laughs> to find a way to justify what my lower nature kind of wants me to do. And even if I'm incapable because of my own weakness of rising to the behavior and the standard that the Baha'i writings call us to, the Baha'i writings again and again and again in the example of Abdu'l-Baha shows me very clearly that the standard is very high. But I don't want to lose the fact that justice is in there as well. So there are stories of Abdu'l-Baha, you know, the cab driver who, who tried to charge him more money. Um, individuals who excluded black people and wouldn't allow Louis Gregory to sit with him, the hotel who wouldn't allow black people into the hotel, the business person who stole coal from the Baha'is in the middle of winter. What Abdu'l-Baha did in all of those instances, which is also interesting because he wasn't the victim, he was like advocating on behalf of someone else in all of those incidences, which is also important. Um, but in, in all of those instances, he stood up for justice calmly lovingly and engaged. It wasn't like, when I mean, you read those stories, and, I, and we don't have time for, for all of those stories, but I encourage you to read those stories. Justice is there. 
So I don't, I don't want us to get into this binary false dichotomy of justice is anger and vengeance and retribution and forgiveness is passivity um, being, you know, letting yourself be oppressed or being subordinate. That is false. Those dichotomies are false. And there's so much beautiful complexity in the example of Abdu'l-Bahá and how he dealt with justice. Um, but why we should grapple, even though it's super uncomfortable and maybe even annoying to, to read these stories and these writings when we don't feel like we can do it ourselves, is because, and I'm not being dramatic when I say this, because world peace depends on it. We're told world peace depends on us getting this right. So the quote specifically says, peace must first be established among individuals until it leadeth in the end to peace among nations. Wherefore, O ye Baha'is, strive ye with all your might to create through the power of the word of God, genuine love, spiritual communion, and durable bonds among individuals. So world peace depends on us getting this right. So thank you for being here. And I enjoyed, and I still enjoy learning about this topic. It's very nuanced and complicated. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so next week, our speakers will be Brett and Maureen Smith, and they'll be talking about the person and life of Abdu'l-Bahá. So again, this is every Saturday at noon Eastern time. And if you're not on our mailing list, um, I put a link to our contact form in the chat, and I've also posted the, the document containing the quotations that were discussed today. So we'll go ahead and end with some writings of Abdu'l-Bahá set to music.
Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <clears throat>